All right, please be seated. What an amazing word to describe our God. Amazing and amazing grace. This morning we want to honor one of our long marchers. We've got a couple of long marchers on the platform this morning. You're going to hear from one of them, but we want to honor Duke Westover. Uh, Duke was born in Houston, Texas. He's been a member, he is now a member of the Board of Trustees of Liberty University. And for many, many years, he served alongside of our founder and chancellor, uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell Sr., who is executive, uh, as his executive assistant. Duke and his wife, Carlene, and Carlene is seated right over here, all right? Duke and his wife, Carlene, operate Ducar International Tours a wholesale tour company specializing in taking people to Israel and other Middle Eastern countries. Since 1981, Dukar has taken thousands of people to the Holy Land, including 1,500 at one time. That's a lot of buses lined up in a line. At this writing, Duke has traveled to Israel 89 times. Uh, in January of 2016, Duke was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his steadfast commitment to bringing tourism to Israel and his endless contribution to the Jewish state. This award was presented from Israel, the Israel Knesset and the World Jewish Congress, and we thought it would be a wonderful thing this morning if we could give that award to him in front of all of you. So, Duke, if you would come now, please. And Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Carlene, do you want to stand over there? Uh, th this is the lady behind the throne. And behind, but anyway, we're glad to have both of you and to do this. Thank you, you so God much. God bless you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for coming. And recognition like this doesn't come easily. And I appreciate everything that's gone on at Liberty University. Uh, I've been here for a long time. I was here the day Liberty University started, so I've seen a little change. The average Israeli, most Israeli that I know, believe that the evangelical Christians are the, the best friend that Israel has. That's, always, that's not always been the case. And I believe that that particular movement started in 1956 when Jerry Falwell graduated from college because one of the prime things in college was the Abrahamic covenant. Those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those that curse Israel will be cursed. And if you look down through the history, you'll see an ash heap of people who have cursed Israel. And right now today though, but Jerry Falwell started preaching the Abrahamic Covenant in his church and on television. And then we started the Moral Majority in 1979. That was one of the tenets, the four tenets of the Moral Majority. Pro-life, pro-family, pro-national defense, and pro-Israel. And we started taking tours during that time. And others started taking tours during that time. Now. Uh, about 80% of the tourism that comes from America comes from evangelical Christians. So Liberty University has been a major part of that movement since 1956. And once again, I appreciate the recognition. I love Liberty. I love your kids. My daughter graduated from here in 1981, excuse me, 1991. So we're Libertyites. We love you. Thank you so much for everything. God bless. At Liberty, we're blessed to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants like Duke Westover, and thank you for acknowledging him and welcoming him. Well, many have already heard that uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, November the 8th is a big day. After years of dialogue and discussion and debate, it's the day of decision, and it's what you've all been waiting for because tomorrow classes are canceled.
and, and from three o'clock to five o'clock, dorms are open. You can thank President Falwell for making that possible. You may also have heard, though, about another event that's taking place tomorrow, and I hope that you will be fulfilling your biblical and civic responsibility as a freedom-loving person to go out and cast your vote for the person that God leads you to vote for. All eyes are on liberty. All eyes are on our precinct. And so let's send a message tomorrow that LU votes, and let's let the whole nation know that as young people, as the future of our nation, you are taking your responsibility in doing just that. Just some details to help you. If you live on campus and you're registered to vote, you'll be voting here in the Vine Center anytime between 6 a.m. How many 6 a.m. folks? Uh, all right. 6 a.m. all the way up to 7 p.m. You'll need to remember to bring your flames pass at your identification to be able to get in. And uh, free food for all uh, out amongst on the concourse outside the Vine Center. Uh, and hope you'll be here to do that. If you live at the Annex, uh, you'll be Annex over here, all right. You're going to be voting at the Sheffield Elementary School. There's going to be bus service leaving the Annex on every half hour all the way up to 6.30 p.m. Uh, the last bus will depart and hope that the Annex people will be out as well. So hope, thank you for participating and let everyone know that LU votes. Also tonight, College Republicans are holding an event with Senator Jeff Sessions. It'll be 7 o'clock p.m., the concert hall in the School of Music. Hope you can be out and take part of that. And then very importantly, also tonight, a uh, night of worship and prayer for our nation, emphasizing unity amongst our student body as we are united together in Christ. Hope that you'll come out for that 8 p.m. in LaBahay event space to worship together and pray for our country. And uh, this is a very pivotal time in our nation. And uh, we want to show the world that we are united as brothers and sisters in Christ, and just praying that as this event continues on, as our election takes place, that we will be able to manifest not just that we're politically active, but that we are followers of Jesus Christ and live and conduct ourselves in a way so that He is magnified and glorified through the events of tomorrow. Let's do that. I also have the privilege this morning now of introducing to you a great friend of Liberty University. Our guest today played one season uh, with the New York Jets in the NFL, 1981 to 1982. He then went on to serve as the Liberty University Vice for Urban Ministry uh, in 1987. And then in 1988, uh, Michael Faulkner and his family moved to New York City, where he served as the assistant pastor and director of the Lamb Center for the Lamb's Church in Times Square. He's now a resident of New York, of Harlem, and he is running for the mayor of New York City in 2017. Let's give it up for Michael Faulkner, future mayor of New York City. Good morning, LU! I am so excited to be here on the eve of what has been called the most important election of our lifetime, of America. And I know that's been thrown around a bit, but I actually believe it's true. Now I, I, I'm, I'm having a, a, I had a tough time, I was very conflicted because as a preacher, I know I want to honor the preacher who's coming with the word of the day, and so I want it to be short and concise. But as a, I'm not a politician, I'm a social entrepreneur, but as someone running for elected office, I thought, wow, I want to give a, a rousing political speech. But I don't want to do that either, so I'm going to speak to you as a dad. I'm going to speak to you from my heart. My daughter's a, a senior here, and, and I just want to communicate some truth to you. Is that okay? I said, is that okay? Listen, we are in a tough situation as a nation. The next president is likely to uh, uh, nominate and to, to have uh, uh, brought into uh, fruition the next four Supreme Court justices. 
That alone just sends shivers down my spine to think that we would give that responsibility to someone who doesn't honor the Constitution. And then, not, not to mention, that same president is inheriting a, a weakened economy and a division between Americans unlike any I've ever seen. The racial divide in our nation is greater than I've seen at any time during my lifetime. You know, we, we do have a growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots. But in my opinion, as I see it, the cause is not race or racism. Oh, sure, it's involved, but that's not the root cause. And it's not going to be resolved by black rage or white guilt or by a progressive politician showing up every time something happens and blaming someone for the problem. We as Americans need to band together, need to come together in unity, each other realize our God-given potential. This next president needs you need your involvement. First, you got to vote for them. Then they need your involvement as Christians. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I, says the Lord, will their land. We want a better America. We need to be better citizens. Can somebody help me with an amen? amen. I am running to be the next mayor for the city of New York because I love that city. And God has called us to be salt and light. I have had the privilege of growing up in a middle-class family in Washington, D.C. I understand what it means to serve others. I had the, the, the privilege of going to a Jesuit high school and learn uh, the commitment to my fellow man, and then going to Virginia Tech, uh, whose motto, and my, my bachelor's and master's degree, whose motto is up prostum, which means that I may serve. I have served my entire life, and then in 1984, 85, I met this radical, radical, crazy Christian named Dr. Jerry Falwell, and he invited me to come to Liberty and be a part of this movement here, and I was privileged to have my family as part of this family here, and then in 1988, God surprised me and called me back into New York City where I ran a soup kitchen, and I bandaged the wounds of those prostitutes, and I worked in the belly of the beast. And I believe that my going to, to New York it, it was God's calling on my life, and I do believe that God has called me to be mayor. I do believe that it is this season of my life now that God has prepared me for my entire life. And I want to serve in the name of Christ with dignity, with respect, with honor. I want to end the soft bigotry of low expectations. I want to help people understand we can do better. We will do better. When something happens, I want to be able to look people in the eye and say, what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? This, the, the government promises to deliver you through the salvation of the, 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 uh, uh, the salvation of the welfare system has not worked in 50 years. And I am a conservative, I have lived and worked in Harlem, and I am the messenger that can point to people and deliver that message with enthusiasm. And guess what? It is well received. Believe it or not, it is well received. I do a lot of campaigning. I have knocked on over 6,000 doors in the past year and a half. I started my campaign in the housing projects of New York City, the place they said, don't go. And I go, you know what? It is received enthusiastically. 
because people can understand, they can discern the love that I have, the care that I have, the concern that I have for them, for their well-being. Not looking for government solutions, but looking to help them band together to do better for themselves, for their families, and for communities. That's what this is all about. As conservatives, we have to get our message out to America right now. It is urgent. It is important. My candidacy is important. It's important for New York. And here's what I want you to do about it. I need your help. I need your help right now more than any other time in my life. And I'm going to ask you to do three things. One is I'm going to ask you to pray for me and my family, because this is a grueling, grueling process. I am out most nights during the week, and up early in the morning, well, that was always the case. But it has been a grueling process. I need your prayers. Secondly, if you are on social media, and I know all of you are, I need you to go to my Facebook page and like it. Important that you follow what's going on. We are campaigning every day. We are meeting religious leaders, people in the cities, and so forth, and we are doing what we need to do. I need more likes on my social media. <laughs> Hello? I'm putting it out there, right? <laughs> Lastly, if you would like to get notifications from us about what is going on, you can text the word mayor to 67076. Text the word mayor, do it right now, because I know you'll forget. What was that number again? 67076. Type the word mayor, you'll receive a notification and my enthusiasm, and I'll communicate with you on a regular basis, and you can opt out at any time. It is I'm excited that we're on the eve of this great election, and I'm looking forward to being the mayor of the city of New York next year this time. Thank you, and God bless you. We want to spend a few minutes praying together uh, for our nation in just a second. I do want to tell you that this is not so much of an announcement as much as it is just for you to be aware that um, tomorrow we have students representing every single state uh, of the United States here on campus. And so we've, we've pulled from every single state a, a, a different student who's going to be praying in different stations all day during the day tomorrow. And so that's going to be a pretty amazing thing. Uh, where well, we're just really asking the Lord, uh, more than anything else, for just an awakening and, and a revival in, in our land, as uh, Michael was talking about just a few minutes ago. Uh, let me let you know that there's a career fair coming up. Um, the fair will be hosted by the School of Divinity on November the 15th uh, at 1230. Uh, it'll go to 4 o'clock. Uh, it'll be held at the Montview Student Union Alumni Ballroom. That's the ballroom with all the pieces of art. So just on its own, that's worth going to see uh, outside of, of, of that. This, this school fair, uh, this career fair is going to be pretty amazing. Seventy organizations are coming from all around the world. Uh, to, to really make job opportunities available to you. And I know that our School of Divinity is hosting it, but let me just tell you, uh, if you are uh, a student with a business degree or an education degree, or if you're someone in the IT world, they are looking, these organizations, for all kinds of people to give jobs to, all kinds of people to give internship opportunities to. And so it's not just focused on music majors and worship students, you know, and, and those kind of folks. It's, it, this literally is more than just an opportunity for pastors to go and be on staff. It's an opportunity for all of us. Definitely worth our while as a student body to go out and check out at the Montview Student Union uh, Alumni Ballroom. I have the privilege of getting to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today. Our keynote speaker uh, shares one thing in common with our last speaker on last Friday in that he serves on our board of trustees. Dr. Thorpe has been on our board of trustees for 20 years eight faithful years. Isn't that amazing? But um, 
even bigger than that, um, he has since 1964 been on staff as a leader. Uh, that's a whole lot longer than even 28 years at, um, at Temple Baptist Church in Odessa, Texas. Dr. Thorpe travels around the, around the country and almost every Sunday, over 50 Sundays a year, uh, he speaks at different churches all around, really not just the United States, but the world. Uh, he used to do like 25, 30 youth camps during the summer. We don't even have that many weeks, but he would just go from one place to another. Just an incredible communicator, a faithful servant, um, just to God's Word. And um, the, the few years that I've been here on staff, uh, Dr. Thorpe has always just been such an encouragement to me. He's always wanted to know about you. And every time we run into each other at Board of Tr uh, Trustee events, he, he asks about you. He asks about your spiritual welfare, and he just seems to have a, a real father figure kind of posture in everything that he does. We're so blessed to have him here with us today. Can we just um, put our hands together for Dr. Jerry Thorpe? Thank you, my friend. Okay, I'm a Texas boy. And I decided not to come up here and say the normal stuff we say, good morning and stuff like that, but I'm going to talk cowboy to you and I want all of you. I was listening to Tim Lee the other day and I said, how great would it be if I gave a little Texan and the whole crowd said it back? So here's my greeting. You ready? Howdy. Howdy. Yeah. The I always like it when there's a yeehaw in the crowd. The greatest thing that ever happened in my life happened when I was your age. I was an 18-year-old freshman in college, went in a small church in Texas on the first Sunday night of January 1955. I stepped out in what, to the front, knelt at an altar before a holy God, told him I was not a holy person and ask him if he would be my savior, come in and change my life. And that night, Jesus Christ totally changed Jerry Thorpe. That's been 62 years ago, 62 years ago. I am 80 years old now, how about that? And the greatest thing that ever happened to me is Jesus Christ. The second greatest thing that ever happened to me is that 58 and a half years ago, Freddie and I were married. <laughs> Freddie's a girl. <laughs> Didn't want you to be mixed up about that. And as David said 28 years ago, it's really bad, almost 29. Dr. Falwell asked me to be on the board. I was in B Baptist Bible College with him. Asked me on the board. It's been a privilege to serve. And I want you guys to know of all of the beautiful things that are happening in your life here now, there's a lot of great people that paid a great price to make this possible. So you need to honor them, and you do that very well, and God bless you. I'm going to talk to you this morning on the subject of choices. Choices. Because I'm a big fan of classical music, I've always loved the singing of Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash and George Jones. George sang a song that goes with this message. It was called Choices. And in this song, George is singing of his life. He was a great, great voice in country music, one of the biggest stars, but boy, did he ever live a wild life. Primarily because when he was young, he made the choice to make alcohol his drink of choice, which led to amphetamines and then cocaine. He was strung out, hung over, drunk so much that he missed so many shows, he was called No Show Jones. He was married four times, divorced three times. And in March 8, 1999, driving his Lexus SUV utility truck with a bottle of whiskey in the front seat with him, without his seat belt on, talking to his daughter on the telephone, he went right into a bridge abutment. He was driving drunk and came about as close to killing a man as you can come. In fact, it took them two hours to cut him out of the car. and. 
months of recuperation. His next album was called Cold Hard Facts, and the first cut of that album, album is a song called Choices. The words are on your screen. He put his story bluntly. George said, I've had choices since the day that I was born. We all have, you know. In fact, as you guys get older and, and people will talk to you and they'll say, tell me about your life. Your life will be defined by the choices that you've made and the choices you're making now. How you treat your family, how hard you study in school, what your morals are, the level of friendship you keep and the quality of your friends, how hard you're willing to work, and your relationship with Jesus Christ. When you get up as old as I am and somebody says, tell me about your life, your life will be defined by the choices you've made. George said, I've had choices since the day that I was born. Next line said, I've heard voices that told me right from wrong. And again, we all have. Our parents, our teachers at school, Sunday school teachers, our pastors, we're surrounded by voices that try to give us guidance. And the next line George said is such a sad line, if I had listened, if I'd only listened, I wouldn't be here today living and dying by the choices that I've made. When I talk to you about choices this morning, I'm not talking about the choice to get an extra dip of ice cream on your cherry pie or what kind of a car you drive or what kind of clothes you wear. I'm talking about a choice sometimes that has the potential to really spiral your life. And even more than that, maybe scuttle, if you know what that word means, scuttle God's plans for your life. And through the years, there hasn't been a whole lot of encouragement in our American culture to resist temptation by making right choices. Did you ever think of our mottos? Everybody's doing it. If it feels good, do it. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. And the Nike group says, just do it. Do you notice that the fallout from bad choices litter our culture? If you watch evening news on television, it's just line after line after line of people that have made the choice to do something that is so bad that it results in disaster. But bad choices also litter our family and friends. There's not any of you, I wouldn't think, that have somebody in your family or somebody in your friendship, and, and they do things, you can't, you can't put it in your head, you can't understand why they do the things that they do. It litters the Bible. King David was referred to as a man after God's own heart, but he lost in a moment of lust with Bathsheba what it had taken him an entire lifetime to gain, and David found out that temptation is a liar. It promises what it cannot produce. The night before he was crucified, when the apostle Peter, you're going to be tempted to make a choice because I'm going to be arrested and it's going to get hard. You're going to make a choice be tempted to deny me. And Peter's like all of us when we're faced with preaching like I will do this morning. Oh, come on, Jerry, that could never happen to me. That's what Peter said to the Lord. Come on, I could never, these other guys might deny you, but I will never deny you. But of course he did. Here we go to get the wisdom and strength to say no when we want to say yes. Well, let's start with God. Here's a verse on your screen. The Apostle Paul said, but remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. But God is faithful. Keep reading. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out that you will not give in to it. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who was a student of Plato and a teacher of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle said once, what lies in our power to do lies in our power not to do. When I was pastoring in Odessa, our church became the largest church by far in our community. I had 11 full-time staff ministers, and I was constantly talking to these people. The devil would like to a choice that could really destroy your ministry and hurt the church. And I kept saying, 
But God will not let that happen to you unless you're willing to run the red lights, unless you're willing to run the stop signs, because God was faithful, and He will always say, don't go there, that's a bad place to be. Well, I want to give you a biblical example of right choices. And this is a story of a young man named Joseph. We pick him up at 17 years of age, who under very stressful and tempting situations made right choices and came out a winner. Let me tell you a little about his life. He grew up the apple of his dad's eye. He was the 11th of 12 children, boys. So he grew up a pampered 17-year-old. Perhaps you've read about the coat of many colors that his dad gave him. He's a 17-year-old Jewish boy raised by a single father in a dysfunctional home. His dad had children of two wives and two midwives, four women in all. His brothers were Hellions. I mean, Joseph's home would have been a hit on the Jerry Springer show. You'd have read about that in TMZ on your television set. And because of the jealousy of his brothers, he was sold by his own brothers to a group of slave traders who took him to Egypt to sell him for a slave. Here's a 17-year-old kid. He arrived in Egypt in chains. His hopes shattered his life in Potiphar, who was the captain of King Pharaoh's guard, which is kind of like the FBI, kept up in one man. And all of a sudden, this guy, 17 years old, was thrust into a brand new culture, a brand new language, a brand new standard of morality with no hope of going home. He went from a pampered son to hatred within his family, to a long ride on a slave wagon, to a wide-eyed, what had, had to be a wide-eyed boat ride down the Nile River, to a frightening experience on the auction block, to a new life as the lowest of slaves. If there was ever a prime candidate to throw his life away by making a bunch of bad choices and blaming it on the fact that my mom died when I was young, my dad showed me so much favoritism, my brothers hated me, and my brothers were so mean, and I didn't get any breaks, and here I am in Egypt, and I'm a slave, and I've been sold, and I'm working in the stables. What does it matter what I do? What does it matter how I act? But Joseph didn't do that. He was smart. He had a strong faith in God. He was a quick thinker, so he just went to work probably in the stables or in the fields. And after some years of adjustment and hard work and such success that he now ran Potiphar's household, Joseph was accosted by Potiphar's wife, a liberated, probably beautiful, turned on but bored woman who made repeated attempts to seduce him. She even arranged the setting and took away all the difficulties she could see, and she was ready to go. And all of a sudden, a young man raised in an environment of God was faced with a brand new temptation, and he had to make some tough choices. Now, I want you to read about it with me. We're going to read 12 verses. Normally, we don't do that in a setting like this, but let's do it this morning. You can follow along on your screen from Genesis 39. The Bible said when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. But the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Pay attention to verse 3. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of the master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, Potiphar didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph, the Bible next says, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Now, I got a comment on that. <laughs> it's not wrong to be well-built and handsome. It's not… It's not fair. 
but it's not wrong. <laughs> so soon Potiphar's wife began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Now I want you to read carefully the next verses because we're going to get some thoughts here for you. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master, trust me, was everything in this entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has kept back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a sin against God. But she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was in the house, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran, he ran from the house. Here's a young man that made great choices. <clears throat> he was probably in his mid-twenties, he's a long way from home. He's surrounded by people who live that way, and I did my research on Egypt, Egypt when Potiphar, uh, Joseph was there, but he refused. I think he asked himself five questions that are the basis of the message. <clears throat> five questions you might ask yourself anytime you're faced with something that requires a difficult choice. First of all, Joseph said, who gets hurt? If I do this, who gets hurt? The verse said, Joseph refused. Look, he said to Potiphar's wife, my master trusts me with everything in the household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has kept back nothing from me except you. Joseph first considered how it would affect others. His first thought was not himself. He's a young, virile, handsome, long way away from home, probably a very beautiful woman, on the attack day after day. But Joseph wasn't thinking of himself. His family wasn't there, so they weren't a consideration. But he said, he has been very good to me. He, he bought me as a slave, but he gave me work, and, and he honored my work, and now I'm running the whole household. And not only that, he's recognized that God is important in my life. And then he comes home and finds out that I've been sleeping with his wife. That's not going to happen. Now, wouldn't it be great if when any of us were tempted, we first decided who gets hurt? Do I really want to hurt my parents that way? Do I really want to hurt the people in my church? Do I want to hurt my pastor? Do I want to hurt my family? There are people in your life who love you, support you, depend upon you. Anytime you're facing something like that, back up and ask, if I do this, who gets hurt? Second question I think Joseph asked was, what are my moral convictions? What do I really believe about this stuff? Joseph said, I will not do it because you are his wife. Now Joseph had moral convictions because he respected God and God's Word. Now Potiphar's wife had a different view. She obviously believed that sex was just a recreational activity between consenting adults for personal pleasure. It's just a physical act which is seeming a very prevalent view in the society in which you're living now. It's just a physical act. It's no big deal. If Joseph had taken that view, he would have slept with her. But Joseph didn't take that view. Joseph would have understood that God was involved in this. And Joseph would have understood, I think, that God gave sex to be a beautiful part of a relational commitment of love a relational commitment of love. He would have understood that God is not anti-sex, but God is pro-marriage, and Joseph planned to be married someday. So, let me get my next page. Joseph understood, perhaps, that if you in your life make sex a plaything, maybe you lose the real thing. And Joseph would have understood this commandment of God is God's protection of the sanctity and importance of my marriage, because Joseph intended to be married someday, and he knew what God's view was this, so he backed up. He had moral convictions because he respected God and respected His Word. Third question. I think Joseph asked, where is God? 
Notice the verse on your screen. Joseph said, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Who gets hurt? What are my moral convictions? Where is God? Potiphar's wife must have said, whoa, 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 time out, boy. Have you looked around here? Potiphar's on a business trip. I've made sure the servants are involved somewhere. There's no one else in this house but us. The doors are bolted. The doors are locked. It's just you and me. But Joseph realized there was someone in his life that could go through bolted doors, who sees in the darkness. No one other person might know, but God would know. In Psalms chapter 139, the psalmist said, where can I go from His presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths of the sea, you're there. If I go to the blackness of night, you're there. So Joseph purposed in his heart. Please listen, it's not a shallow commitment. It's not saying, okay, I know God's okay at church, but when I'm on a date, no, God's there. Uh, okay, I know God's okay at church, but when I'm at my job, sometimes, no, no, God knows about all of this. Oh, okay, I know God's okay at church, but we're taking a trip to Vegas, and you know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? No, God's in Vegas. <laughs> and I go at night, and I sit down with my computer, and everybody else is asleep, and I can go anywhere I want to, no one will ever know. Yes, someone will know. I preached in Farmington, New Mexico the first Sunday of September, and God blessed the Catholic churches of San Juan County in Farmington, New Mexico, because outside of one of these sleazy point joints, they put up a sign that'll be up on your screen. When you drive on the parking lot to that place, <laughs> that's the first thing you see. <coughs> Don't you love it? Jesus is watching you. You know something, guys? There's a scary verse about David and Bathsheba. David brought her in. She, he, she was another man's wife, slept with her. She got pregnant. He did everything he could to cover it up, to hide it. But there's a verse that says in 2 Samuel 11:27. The thing he did displeased the Lord. And I know, wherever I am, you might ever know, but God knows. And I don't want to do that thing that displeases the Lord. Someone is always watching. In London, a pastor of a local church got on a trolley one Monday morning, gave the driver a bill took the change, went back and sat down, and then absentmindedly counted his change and said, whoa, he gave me way too much change. So at the next stop, he walked back up and said, sir, excuse me, when I gave you the bill, you, you made a mistake. You gave me way too much change. And the driver smiled at him and said, no, pastor, it wasn't a mistake. I know you don't know me, but I know you because I was in your church yesterday, and I heard you preach on honesty. Just thought I'd put you to the test this morning. See if you believe what you say you believe. Somebody is always watching. Fourth question, should I run? She grabbed him. Come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, left his cloak in her hand <clears throat> as he ran from the house. Listen to me, Joseph ran from sexual sin. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, run from sexual sin. That's great advice. You can't have sex while you're running. Run from sexual <laughs> sin, okay? St. Augustine, our Christian forefather, St. Augustine, was a wild liver before he got saved. And after he became a Christian, he was walking down the road and coming toward him was a prostitute that he had frequented early in his life. And when he saw her, he turned around and started running in the other direction. And she called out, Augustine, it is I. 
And St. Augustine said, I know, but it is no longer I. I've been changed by Jesus Christ. Okay, there was this guy, he was, he was way overweight, and he worked here at this company, and he didn't exercise. And one of the reasons he was overweight, because on his way to work every day, he passed a bakery and he stopped every single day and bought a frosted coffee cake and came down and gave a little bit to everybody else and ate most of it himself. And they're fussing at him and griping at him and said, look, you're killing yourself. You've got to quit doing that. You've got to start exercising. You quit. You've got to quit going to that bakery. So they convinced him. And he said, you're right, I've got to change. So for several months, he's doing real good. And he said, I've even changed. I don't drive by the baker anymore, so I don't see those coffee cakes anymore. And he's losing weight and doing good. And then one day he came to work and he walked in with a big frosted coffee cake. And they said, oh no, man, what you do? He said, you know, I don't know, force a habit. I just came that same road and I passed that bakery. And I saw this coffee cake, and I said, God, if you want me to have that coffee cake, let there be a parking place right in front of the bakery, right? And he said, sure enough, the eighth time around the block. (coughs) Now, let me tell you something from long experience. Guys, please listen to me. (coughs) If you come across something that's wrong, don't keep circling the block. Don't keep hanging around. Don't keep playing it out in your mind. Don't keep driving around until one day you find a parking place. Last thought, number five. Joseph asked himself, what are my dreams? You see, back when Joseph was 17 years old at home before his brother sold him, God gave him a dream. Uh-uh, the, the other sheaves of wheat bowed down to his sheaf. And the sun, moon, and stars, he had it in a dream. It's like a statement from God to Joseph that I've got special plans for you. Your life is to be significant. It's going to be meaningful. You're going to make a difference in this world. Now, we all, I guess, grew up with dreams. Most of you came to Liberty University with dreams. There was nothing in Joseph's dream. It was just God saying, I've got a special plan for you. There was nothing in his dream about his brothers hating him. There was nothing in the dreams about the land of Egypt or the auction block or the work in the stables or Potiphar's wife. It's just God saying, I've got a plan for your life. So live in a way that I can bless you. You listening? I have a dream for you, so you live in a way that I can fulfill the dream in you. Joseph went through 13 very difficult years. From the time he was 17, he couldn't find any very many things that he thought God was really making it easy because it was tough. But at age 30, in a miraculous series of events, Potiphar, uh, I'm sorry, not Potiphar, but the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, brought Joseph out of prison and made him, you can read about it, prime minister of Egypt. And as prime minister, he rode in one of the lead chariots, and everybody bowed down to him. He was prime minister for the next 80 years. But when he was 17 years old, God said, I've got something special. Now, if Joseph had got bitter about his brother selling him, or if he had slept with Potiphar's wife, you think the dream would have come true? So live in a way that I could bless you. There's a picture of a lake coming up on your screen. Uh, In Oklahoma, it's uh, lots of Indian tribes in Oklahoma, and this happened a long time ago, and there was an Indian tribe on either side of the lake, and sometimes they had their intertribal meetings, and at one of those, a very handsome young man met a beautiful girl from the other tribe, and they just fell for each other, head over heels. They didn't get to see each other too much, but when the tribes got together and they planned their life together, but they lived across the lake. But they had this little tradition. Every night, this young man would stand at the edge of the lake and he would call out, like, if if this is not wrong, an Indian love call across the water of the lake, and then he would hear her voice coming back to him. And that's what they did every night. He would call to her, she would call back to him. 
Well, it's the end of January, it's freezing, it's snowing, it's nasty. And he's there and he calls out his love, and then he hears her voice, and he can't stand it. I know it's cold, I know it's difficult. But I'm young, and I'm strong, and I'm virile, and I can do this. So he dived in the lake to swim across to see his beloved. But he got about halfway out there, and it was so cold, he realized I'm not going to make it. It's too far to go back. It's too far to go to her. So he lifted himself out of the water with his last breaths, and he called out his love, and then he sank beneath the water and drowned. Yeah, that's sad. So then, uh, <laughs> so the tribes got together, the tribes got together and they thought they had recognized what this young man has done. So that people in the future, people in the future would look back and remember what this young man did. So they decided they had renamed the lake after this young man what he had done, we're going to name the lake after him. So they named the lake, Lake Stupid. <laughs> now I know that's a big disappointment to all of you girls. You're saying, Lake, I will love you forever. Lake, I'll swim the oceans for you. No. What he did, what he did was stupid. <laughs> right? Oh, okay. If I got a couple of minutes. Uh, I, I, okay, listen. The reason I preach this message to you this morning is I'm trying to keep you from swimming around in Lake Stupid. And I've got three thoughts. Just, I want to name them to you. If you want to stay out of Lake Stupid, first of all, make sure you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. God doesn't want to be your co-pilot. God wants to be your pilot. And second, make sure you're a part of a local church and serving the Lord in the local church. But more than that, more than, not more than that, but equal with that, when you walk in the church on Sunday morning and say, hi, God, and God says, hi, listen, where have you been? And you say, well, I was here last Sunday. Yeah, I know you were here Sunday, but I really wanted to talk to you Monday. And I thought you'd read about me Monday, and I really thought you might talk to me Tuesday, but you didn't, and I thought maybe we'd communicate Wednesday. Keep a daily relationship with God. And I got one other thought. Make, make sure Jesus is a reality. Keep a daily relationship with God. And if you want to lay, stay out of Lake Stupid, quit hanging around people that are swimming in Lake Stupid. Thank you.